So hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, joint webinar of the Law Society of Hong Kong and Lawyers Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage, entitled Dispute Resolution Framework under the Belt and Road Initiative, Options and Organizations Involved. I am William Wong, member of the uh, International Legal Affairs Committee of the uh, Law Society of Hong Kong. So today's event will delve into the intricacies of resolving cross-border disputes within the framework of the initiative, exploring the available options and the key organizations that play a role in this context. It is our great honor to have renowned speakers from Hong Kong and Thailand to share with us their insights and experiences on this topic. So the presentation today will be conducted mainly in English with a simultaneous interpretation in Thai and vice versa. So please turn on the interpretation mode in the bar menu as necessary. Please note that due to the setting in Zoom, the Thai language option is indicated as Chinese. Now regardless, the audio output from our simultaneous interpretation channel remains between English and Thai. So in, in other words, there is no Chinese channel today. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind you some more important notes on this Zoom webinar. A, in this webinar, you are automatically muted and are in listening mode only. B, and if the chat room itself allows you to send messages to the host, panelists, and attendees. And C, if you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to type your question in the Q&A box during or after the presentations. For further details, instructions regarding the Zoom webinar functions, please refer to the chat message uh, that has just been posted by the Secretariat. Now, without further ado, may I now first invite Dr. Wichian uh, Chup Tai Song, President of Lawyers' Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage, to welcome our participants with his opening remarks. Dr. Chup Tai Song, please. Lian Tan Pu Balihan, the Lawyer Society of Hong Kong. กรรมการบริหารสภาทนายความและผู้เข้าอบรมทุกท่านครับผมมีความยินดีเป็นอย่างยิ่งที่ได้มีโอกาสจัดงานร่วมกันกับ The Law Society of Hong Kong ในหัวข้อเรื่อง Dispute Resolution Framework under the One Bell One Load Initiative Option and organization in one day one day to what been to them don't make an same sign from some pan and the love one song on gone do I what to a song they can chat some on a room can they hang me go here teach a play book at hey so much it can I quam thang song on gone they me can let the end from loo jail cup thang lia they can line up copy pop let no one and take your con my body at Hong Kong กับประเทศไทยทําให้มีโอกาสได้รู้จักองค์กรที่มีบทบาทสําคัญในกระบวนการระงับข้อพิพาทรวมถึงแนวทางการปฏิบัติที่เหมาะสมกับการดําเนิน
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chuktai Song. May I now also invite Mr. Amirani Nasir, Vice President of the Law Society of Hong Kong, to extend a warm welcome to the participants. Mr. Nasir, please. Thank you. Dr. Ashen Chap Tai Song, President, Lawyers Council, Thailand, under the Royal Patronage, distinguished speakers and moderator, members of the Law Society of Hong Kong and <clears throat> Law Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage. Good morning or good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today joint webinar. We are delighted to have over 130 members joining us today. The Belt and Road Initiative was first brought about remarkable opportunities and challenges for businesses and individuals across the globe. As we navigate the complexities of cross-border transactions and investments, it is crucial to have a robust dispute resolution framework in place. Today, we are going to explore various options available and key organizations involved in this context. Before we begin, please allow me to provide a brief introduction to the Law Society of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong legal system. Established in 1907, the Law Society of Hong Kong is both the self-regulatory body and professional association for solicitors in Hong Kong. It is, it is entrusted with the statutory duty to monitor the conduct of law firms and lawyers to maintain the highest standards of ethics, professionalism, and competence among solicitors. Representing over 13,000 members, the Law Society plays a pivotal role in safeguarding the rule of law and ensuring access to justice for all in Hong Kong. The Law Society devotes much effort in creating international exchange opportunities for the Hong Kong legal profession, both to enable legal practitioners to maintain continuous professional development and to develop international connections. In optimizing the Belt and Road Initiative, the Law Society places great importance and development in continuous development and developing international connections. In optimizing the Belt and Road Initiative, the Law Society plays great importance on the huge business development potential in ASEAN. Over the years, we have established extensive connections through the signing of a memoranda of understanding with various associations and legal organizations from the greater China region and overseas. As of October 2023, we have signed a total of 40 four MOUs with 41 overseas lawyers associations and international legal organizations from 26 jurisdictions and 52 MOUs with lawyers associations and organizations in the greater China region. Moving into the Hong Kong legal system, under the principle of one country, two systems, Hong Kong has a well-established legal system firmly based on the rule of law an independent judiciary. Being the only common law jurisdiction within China, the tried and trusted legal system of Hong Kong is always a cornerstone of the city's success. Hong Kong's open policy has attracted great talent from around the world, enriching the diversity of legal services market. As of the end of September, there were 11,000 Hong Kong practicing solicitors and 930 law firms, as well as 1,445 registered foreign lawyers from 32 overseas jurisdictions and 75, 75 registered foreign law firms. As an international dispute resolution center, Hong Kong is a prime venue for dispute resolution throughout arbitration and mediation. Hong Kong's arbitral awards are enforceable in over 160 contracting states in New York, under the New York Convention. This is complemented by respective arrangements for reciprocal enforcement with China, mainland China and Macau. Remarkably, Hong Kong's status as a center for international legal and dispute resolution services in the Asia Pacific region is explicitly supported by the national 14th five-year plan. Hong Kong has a comprehensive and updated legislative framework for arbitration, Recent statutory amendments clarify that intellectual property disputes are arbitrable and third-party funding of arbitration is permissible in Hong Kong. Legislative amendments were 
also passed to allow clients and lawyers to enter into outcome-related fee structures for arbitration. This new regime became fully operative in December 2022, providing additional flexibility in fee arrangements. Furthermore, a new law was passed in October 22, which, when fully implemented, would establish a more comprehensive mechanism for reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters between Hong Kong and the mainland. Notably, Hong Kong was ranked world's third most preferred seat for arbitration, according to the 2021 International Arbitration Survey conducted by Queen Mary University of Hong Kong of London. With this, I would like to conclude my remark and pass the floor to our esteemed speakers and moderator, who will share their insights and experience on today's topic, which car carries growing significance to the legal industry. Thank you, and I hope you find this webinar informative and fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nasir. Now, let us now begin this sharing session by the speakers from Hong Kong. Please welcome our first speaker, Ms. Olivia Kong, member of Standing Committee on External Affairs and International Legal Affairs Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Ms. Kong. Hi, everyone. Hi, Olivia. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia. Um, Ronald and I um, are going to give an overview of the Hong Kong uh, law on dispute resolution so that everyone can have a basic understanding of how uh, Hong Kong uh, runs our dispute resolution mechanism. So I will share my screen so that it's easier for all of you to understand what we're talking about. Right. Okay, can you share? Can I share my screen? <laughs> can you guys see the screen? Um, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, can I min let me share the screen? Uh, I, I I think I think it's possible now. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is is working? Right. Yes, working. Okay, so options for dispute resolution in Hong Kong. Your slides are not up yet. Oh, is it running? Not quite, Olivia. Slides not mm. up. Uh, Olivia, I can't see your slides. No. Right. Let me see what's going on. Um, let's see. Can you see it now? Yes. Yay. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So um yes, this is the options for um dispute resolution in Hong Kong. And this is me. <laughs> I'm a partner in um ONC and I'm actually a dual qualified lawyer. Uh I qualify in the UK and practice there for quite a number of years before I return to Hong Kong, uh, my home. And um so I've been doing um litigation since day one. And so uh, I'm here to give you a, a, a overview. Now, okay, so options. What have we got here? Litigation, mediation, adjudication, and arbitration. Now, I will go through litigation, mediation, adjudication, and Ronald will speak about arbitration later. So this is just a very basic court structure of the of the Hong Kong court. So we have got um, a few layers of courts, as you can see from the charts. So we have got the uh, magistrates courts, uh, all these tribunals, and then there is the district court, uh, the high court, which comprises of the court of first instance, court of appeal, and the court of final appeal. Now, small claims tribunal, because this is, I start from here, because I think this may be uh, most relevant to the Thai um, lawyers, uh, because um, normally it will be um, in relation to commercial litigation. So the small claims tribunal is where it handles mainly monetary claims, not exceeding 75,000 Hong Kong dollars. So it's called small claims because um, it's, it's to deal with small amount of, of, of monetary dispute, okay? So there is district court. Uh, now district court has got limited jurisdiction in both criminal and civil matters. 
and it has got um, civil jurisdiction to hear monetary claims over 75,000, but no more than um, uh, 3,000, no, sorry, 300,000, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, well, 3 million, sorry, 3 million Hong Kong dollars, right? So you um, you need to bear in mind about the, um, the, the limitation in terms of the monetary sums because it will go to different places when you file, a, file your claim. The High Court. Now, the High Court um, is basically comprises of the Court of Appeal and the Court of First Instance. And the jurisdiction of Court of First Instance is unlimited in both criminal and civil matters. So apart from general civil cases, um, they also hear appeals from magistrates courts, labor tribunals, small claims tribunal, and obscene articles tribunal. The Court of Appeal uh, hears appeals on all civil and criminal matters from the Court of First Instance and the District Court. And it also hears from the Lands Tribunal and some statutory bodies. Now, the Court of Final Appeal. The Court of Final Appeal basically hears appeals on both civil and criminal cases from the High Court. Cases, um, this is something interesting, and I think you need to bear in mind. Cases heard in the Court of Final Appeal will be heard by the Chief Justice, three permanent judges, and one non-permanent Hong Kong judge or a judge from another common law jurisdiction. So um, it's quite an interesting combination so that it's, it's more it's, it's, it's more fair way of, of looking at the, at the cases. Now, there is this issue about enforcement of foreign judgments in Hong Kong, because I think this was this is something that may be relevant to the um, to the uh, uh, attendees. Uh, how, how to how to enforce judgments in Hong Kong? If say if you have got a judgment in Thailand, what to do? So in Hong Kong, uh, foreign judgments can be enforced by statute or by common law. Uh, for for uh, foreign judgments uh, to be enforced by statute, uh, the foreign judgments, uh, other than the mainland China, is, which is a different regime, in civil and commercial matters may be enforced in Hong Kong via a statutory registration scheme under the Foreign Judgments Reciprocal Enforcement Ordinance. Now, statutory registration only applies to 15 jurisdictions, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Bermuda, Brunei, France, Germany, India, Israel, Italy, Malaysia, Netherlands, New Zealand, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. So a judgment creditor may apply to the court of first instance for registration of the judgment within six years of the date of the judgment, provided that the relevant requirements are set up in the orders are met. Now, the registered judgment has the same effect as if it had been a judgment originally made in a court for the purpose of execution. Now, the limitation date is important, which is six years. So what happens for those who are not registered, uh, those foreign judgments not registered under that ordinance? What can they do? They can be enforced by common law. So in a common law action for enforcement of a foreign judgment, the judgment creditor has to prove that the foreign judgment is a final judgment conclusive upon the merits of the claim. It must be for a fixed sum and must also come from a competent court. So it is still possible to enforce a judgment, a foreign judgment in Hong Kong. Now, this is another issue uh, which uh, interests a lot of people. It's the um, enforcement of mainland and Hong Kong judgments, um, because a lot of times um, there seems to be a connection between um, Hong Kong and mainland in terms of judgments enforcement. Um, so on 26th of October 2022, the legislature of Hong Kong passed the mainland judgments in civil and commercial matters reciprocal enforcement ordinance to, impl to implement the arrangement on reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters by the courts of the mainland and of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region signed in 2019. Now, under the 2019 ordinance, it's only very limited types of monetary judgments can be enforced between the jurisdictions. 
the new ordinance, ordinance will allow a much wider range of civil and commercial judgments of the mainland courts to be enforced in Hong Kong and vice versa. Um, the new ordinance will come into effect um, in early 2024. And uh, in fact, to be precise, um, it's just announced that it will come out on the 29th of January 2024. So bear that in mind. Now, another thing which is interesting is mediation. Um, mediation, it's, um, I, for those of you who are not familiar with this, I'll just give a very brief uh, summary of what, what mediation is about. Mediation is a flexible process conducted confidentially in which a neutral person, um, uh, independent person, i.e. a mediator, assists the parties in working towards a negotiated agreement of a dispute or difference with the parties in ultimate control of the decision to settle the terms of the resolution. So it is more driven by the parties um, to try to settle the matter between themselves rather than continue or to proceed to, um, to litigation in court. Since the 2nd of April, 2009, under the civil justice reform, mediation was introduced as a voluntary dispute resolution process. And now the court may stay court proceedings to enable the parties to mediate. Now, what that means is that, um, for example, during we started the litigation in court. So during the court process, uh, the court can actually stop the court proceedings and, 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 and let the parties try to mediate and try to settle. Only if they fail to settle will they restart the court proceedings. So it gives the chance for the party to try to come up with a solution amongst themselves. Although mediation is not mandatory, as I've mentioned before, court can actually make an adverse course order where a party unreasonably fails to engage in mediation. So this is something I think uh, lots of you will need to bear in mind. So um, basically, it is highly encouraged to try to at least try to attempt mediation, because uh, otherwise the court can actually make an adverse cause order against your client. Now, judges in Hong Kong will not be involved of the mediation process, so the, uh, nor have knowledge of what was discussed during mediation. So the judges um, will not be involved at all. I know I know in some jurisdiction, judges also act some sort of a mediator. Uh, but in Hong Kong, they don't. They have no idea what you guys discuss during mediation. And he will not be informed of the of the of the process. Um, so this is a confidential uh, uh, way of trying to negotiate and lets the party uh, speak freely amongst themselves. Another another way of uh, resolving dispute is called adjudication. Now, adjudication, now what is it? For those people who are not sure what is it, this is where the parties agree that an independent adjudicator will conduct adjudic adjudication according to the contract and specified law. A decision made by an adjudicator is binding. So it is a speedy and effective means to resolve disputes, especially on construction. Or, or building related disputes. So this is something that a lot of um, a construction or building related uh, disputes will be resolved in this way. Adjudicator is usually an expert in technical matters who can reach an interim binding decision. Now the winning party can enforce the adjudication decision against the losing party in its interim stage during the course of the contract if the losing party does not commence litigation or arbitration after the completion of the project. However, the adjudicator's decision is subject to parties' appeal to court or can be amended by an arbitration tribunal later. So it can be, uh, it can be, uh, it can be uh, amended later by the court. So this is something, again, needs to be aware of. Okay, this is my part of the sharing, and I'll pass this to Ronald. Thank you, uh, Olivia. And our next speaker is Mr. Ronald Sum, who is uh, a council member, and uh, and also um. Hello, can you hear me?
Yes, I can. Oh, hear hi, you. sorry. Yep, sorry. So I thought um, I I lost the audience. Hi, Ronald. No, 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 no. Here you go. I I I'm I'm just similar to Olivia, trying to find a button to uh to share my uh, presentation. Just give me one moment. Yes, we see that now. Thank you, Ronald. Uh -huh. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Ronald Sum. I'm a council member of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Um, in some of my Thai counterparts, uh, I have met when I was in uh, when I was in uh, uh, um, um, Thailand last week. Uh, Another four was sitting beside me during the Thai Arbitration Week uh, event. Now, um, my topic today is actually on uh, arbitration. Okay, so I am a partner arbitrator, a mediator. I'm also a CAS arbitrator, the uh, the sports card of arbitration for sports for the IOC. Uh, I am a partner at Pick and McKenzie Hong Kong office. I'm a fellow of the Charlie Institute and the Hong Kong Institute of Arbitrators, etc. Uh, I'm qualified in Hong Kong, England and Wales, Australia, and uh, past the Greater Bay Area exam. So that's enough for me. I don't think here you are here to listen to my qualifications. Now, um, I'll quickly give a brief overview of the arbitration scenes in Hong Kong and some of the uh, more important initiatives that Hong Kong has uh, um, um, for the arbitration matters, okay? So, just uh, next slides. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm going to develop in arbitrations, differences in mediations in Hong Kong and mainland. Uh, you've heard of uh, Olivia uh, speaking about this earlier today and some of the initiatives of the e-hearing. Uh, which Hong Kong is promoting. And uh, not only in Hong Kong, but to all one belt, one road uh, uh, jurisdictions. Now in Hong Kong, um, um, different from the mainland, uh, in Hong Kong, they, uh, they only allow, uh, in, in Hong Kong, they allow both institutional arbitration and ad hoc arbitration. I think in uh, Thailand, they allow, very similar to Hong Kong, they allow both institutional and ad hoc arbitrations as well, calling me if I'm wrong. But in the mainland, uh, only a institutional arbitration is allowed. Why is this important? Because if you have an uh, uh, ad hoc arbitration in the mainland, Okay, so there's no stopping you to have one, but it is not allowable in the mainland. So when it comes to enforcement, you do have a problem because the award may not be legally valid, okay, as a start. Now in Hong Kong, there are various uh, arbitration institutions. There's something called the YIBRAM, which I'll come into is a Hong Kong initiative on the uh, uh, electronic business related arbitration mediation is a totally online platform. The HKIC, ICC Hong Kong, CTAC Hong Kong, the SCIA. Okay, uh, don't mistake it uh, as the SIEC. Okay, this is the South China International Arbitration Center. Now, in the mainland, of course, there are a very, very good, good uh, number of arbitration institutions, but as you can see, CTAC, the Beijing ones are. Uh, uh, the Shanghai ones are basically more the uh, more the uh, uh, common ones. The Guangzhou, the SCIA are more the common ones. Now, um, it's Hong Kong and mainland are both international uh, formats of enforcement. Okay, uh, we'll talk about it very briefly later on today. Um, um, they both follow the New York conventions, but given that Hong Kong is part of uh, mainland China now. We cannot rely on the in, from Hong Kong and from the mainland perspective. We cannot rely on the New York Convention because we are talking about two different countries in 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 uh, uh, for the New York Convention. But uh, in Hong Kong, they have there are arrangements, okay, between the two of them, and of course, uh, the domestic arbitration. Uh, other foreign enforcement is deals with 82 in section 82, the 86 of the arbitration ordinance, which I'm not going to touch on today. Okay. 
free, 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 uh, simple example, million supplier, uh, Thailand purchasers, Hong Kong to see the arbitration. I think that's uh, one of those really basic uh, triangular relationship between in the mainland Hong Kong and the Thai purchaser or suppliers. Now you have heard about uh, the different institutions in in Hong Kong and in the mainland, most of the rules are, are more or less the same. Uh, and uh, uh, given that this uh, lecture or this seminar is on one belt, one road, um, from my experience, I, I have traveled to many belt and road uh, um, countries with Amir uh, some time ago. The first one was to Kazakhstan. I think and many of them adopt uh, very similar rules of arbitration as Hong Kong, as in Thailand, as anywhere else. Um, so I'm going to do, do, I'm not going to talk about the rules that much uh, in this seminar, uh, because as I said, the rules are the same, more or less the same. Okay. But there are certain measures which I think uh, um, one should look at. For example, the, so to speak, recent, recent is probably two or three years old, interim measures arrangements between Hong Kong and mainland. Um, when, when, when I first started my career um, nearly 30 years ago, uh, my mentor, who has unfortunately passed away, have actually told me this, okay, uh, no one is worried about any dispute resolutions or litigation or arbitration. They are very concerned, clients are very concerned about if they get an award, if they get a judgment whether they can enforce that award, whether they can enforce that judgment. Enforcement, in a sense, is to get monetary compensation, okay, not just a number of pages of judgments or awards. So when that brings in the, the, the point, the interim measures, okay, can be obtained once a dispute arises. Now, I'm not going to talk about, because of time constraint, interim measures and interim awards, okay, but it is sufficient to say that, that for this purpose, both of them is to preserve the status quo of the, of the parties. Now, uh, interim measures can take place in many forms, preliminary orders, procedural orders, directions, and partial awards, okay? So these are the interim uh, uh, measures which one can get. Now, of course, here yeah, for the ICC, the ICC requires emergency arbitrator's decision to take the form of an order, okay, so as to enforce the interim measures under ICC arbitrations. Now, um, the, the, the good thing about this arrangement between mainland and Hong Kong is that um, um, uh, when there's a dispute, Oh, um, an arbitration in Hong Kong, which involves mainland, which may require the protection or the seizure of mainland assets. Okay, this arrangement comes in very handily. Okay, because it provides a number of interim measures, as you can see uh, from this part here, this slide here: assets preservation, uh, evidence preservation, conduct preservation, as long as. It provides for disputes arising out of and relating to a contract to be resolved by arbitration only. The seat of the arbitration is in Hong Kong. The arbitration is to be administered by one of the qualifying institutions. You remember in the first slide, I talk about ad hoc and institutional arbitrations, okay? Because in the mainland, in China, they do do not allow ad hoc arbitrations. So only the uh, only institutional arbitrations is, so to speak, legal. So when you obtain any interim measures, it must be from one of the institutions, okay, arbitration institutions. There are seven of them, which I've named earlier in the first slides. The Yibram, which is on 9 KIC, ICC, uh, Hong Kong, and of course, the new one is called Alco. Okay, uh, which is the uh, um, Asia Africa Legal Cooperation Arbitration Center. Now, it is a very simple process. Many people have asked, oh, is, um, do we have to go through more or less the uh, common law type injunctions, etc.? No. Okay, you can see the two stage process. 
prior to the relevant institutions in Hong Kong, specifying the particulars of the party, details of the applications, the justification on which the application is placed, as well as information about the property in the mainland that will be used as security of certification of financial standards. The institutions will forward the application to the relevant mainland Chinese courts to consider whether relief should be granted under mainland laws. So it is a simple two-stage process. You commence arbitration in one of the seven institutions. Then the institution will forward the a application to the mainland Chinese courts. Now, and it's up to the mainland Chinese courts under uh, Chinese law to see whether an application is granted. Now, uh, uh, you all may be thinking, obviously, uh, under Chinese courts or under any courts, it may be difficult to grant such a uh, uh, um, uh, interim measures. Has process, you can see the data. Uh, since the interim measures arrangements, 86 applications, 81 and applications for the preservation of assets, two applications for preservation of evidence, three applications for uh, preservation of conduct at least 58 decisions issued by mainland courts. 54 granted the applications. Okay, four rejection, uh, four rejected such an applications. Okay, uh, these are, uh, um, are not secret statistics. Okay, it is in public platforms. So uh, I've done quite a few of them. Uh, it is actually rather easy. Uh, from a private practitioner's perspective, I find it too easy, if you can put it like that. Now, uh, obviously, it's retrospective. If there is an, uh, an, an, an arbitration in Hong Kong and the mainland parties want to seize assets, okay, under Hong Kong laws, it will be by way of a Mariva injunction, anti-suit injunction, prohibition order, and 10 pillars order, okay. Uh, I've set this out all in the slides here. Um, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's a... Uh, um, a long process. Um, it's it's a rather, rather serious process as well. The Marifa injunction is no it's no longer the two stage process. You know, you have to prove dissipation of assets. You have to prove that um, 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 at the end of the the hearing or at the end of the, the arbitration, there's no way of getting your your assets back. Okay, one of those common law or maybe injunction type of application. Okay, it is no difference from before the interim measures arrangements coming into force. Very quickly, uh, so our interim measures uh, became one of the attractions, okay, uh, of having the arbitration seated in Hong Kong because, as you probably know, a lot of the uh, foreign enterprises, uh, uh, including ASEAN, including Thailand, and the Thailand enterprises, uh, will set up their uh, base camp, okay, in Hong Kong and jump into to the mainland. Um, um, also, many of the Thai businesses will have uh, business with mainland entities, and they will choose Hong Kong as the uh, arbitration seat. Okay, so uh, this is one of the uh, initiatives. Okay, it, it is in force already, as you can see, that attracts people to come to Hong Kong for for arbitration. Now, um, of course, uh, I, I would hate to say this uh, in front of all fellow practitioners. Um, uh, we have the OFSA, Outcome Related Fee Structure, okay, um, uh, for arbitration only, because for litigation, there is still the uh, the rules of champerty, okay? You cannot allow a third party to fund a litigation. But in arbitration, because uh, uh, many of the ASEAN jurisdictions, including uh, um, the mainland, including some of the uh, uh, jurisdiction in, in Europe, okay, they do allow outcome-related fee structures uh, type of arrangements. Hong Kong has introduced what we call OFSA, OLFSA agreements. Um, a number of the conditioning uh, conditions governing the operations, enforcement, and termination of the officer are uh, actually uh, set out in the rules. Of course, uh, uh, there's the rules of disclosure uh, uh, before the hearings, etc. Who can provide with the funding? So uh, I can only uh, I'll only say this uh, because of time constraints. 
on on one of the new one of the new initiative okay for uh, arbitration in Hong Kong so for officer um, arrangements um, probably not a no cure no no fee basis but a low uh, no cure low fee basis you know you can put it like that there, there are different structures it will be another topic uh, for another time uh, mutual enforcements okay it's uh, Previously, in 1999, uh, it, it actually becomes very academic uh, because in 1999 in Hong Kong, uh, when they first started the arrangements concerning mutual enforcement of arbitral awards between mainland and Hong Kong, Hong Kong before 1997 used to be a, a, a New York convention jurisdiction or, or, or convention states okay, or convention countries. After 1997, there's no more convention countries. Okay, so it has to be done by way of an arrangement concerning mutual enforcements. There were various uh, uh, drafting amendments, um, just to just to give you a bit of a uh, flavor. Uh, in 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 the earlier version, uh, it is actually very academic. When when you come to enforce it, uh, the the law just simply say hey, you can bring the uh, arbitration award for enforcement. There were many academics saying that before enforcement, should the court recognize and enforce it? Okay, this, these, these are the wordings used by the New York Convention, recognition and enforcement. It's a two-stage process, okay. But uh, in 2020, all these have been rectified. Um, the, the, the steps are very easy. Uh, very, very, if not like the New York Convention, you go to the uh, uh, mainland courts to register your awards and to uh, enforce it. Now, once again, uh, when I did this talk, many people has asked me, oh, it's all up to the mainland courts again. Um, um, yes, but uh, the mainland jurisdictions are extremely uh, uh, arbitration friendly. And I'll tell you why. Because if an enforcement is refused, in a what we call the intermediate people's court, uh, the judge will have to write a long reason to the higher courts, okay, to explain legally why it was not enforced in the mainland. Now, uh, um, if in the higher courts they still refuse to enforce the award, okay, or any awards. Uh, the higher courts will have to write to the highest court of the land in Beijing to explain why it was not enforced. Okay, now obviously Beijing can agree and not agree to enforce. I have not heard. I've only heard of very very limited situations where uh, a, a, a an arbitration award has not been enforced. Okay, if the Beijing highest courts consider that yes, it should be enforced. And and the lower courts uh, are wrong in law, okay, then a remark will be made uh, uh, in the court's file, okay. So uh, um, the main end has become a very arbitration-friendly jurisdiction, um, um, obviously, to promote business there, okay. Uh, the process recognition and enforcement are the same as uh, enforcing uh, uh, and any awards under the New York Convention. Um, Olivia has talked about the the mediation, so I'm not going to uh, uh, go into that. Just uh, uh, very briefly uh, for the last uh, uh, thirty seconds, um, mediation in China is actually very much different to uh, uh, the international mediation. As you can see, there's the people's mediation where. A lot of the small claims are being uh, processed. Okay, they they will not even allow you to register your case unless they go through people's mediation first. Um, just to sort out because there are too many too many cases, um, and of course there is the judicial mediation and the civil procedural laws in China. They do allow judicial med mediation, but the way it is conducted is very much different to that of the uh, um, of of the Hong Kong style uh, or the international style type of mediation. Uh, people's mediation are more, you can say it to be more evaluative uh, and the same as the judicial mediation, whereas many commercial or, uh, mediation are more on the facilitative side. So um, um, 
there, there, there's also the uh, uh, Singapore Convention, etc. I'm not going to go into that. Um, Hong Kong and mainland has their own CEPA uh, investment mediation rules. Uh, that's what I'm going to say about it because once again, there, there are um, um, investors jumping into China to invest through the Hong Kong structure. Okay, and um, and and these are the CEPA closer economic partnership arrangements um, uh, mediation, very similar to the Ancitro Working Group Three uh, investor state mediation style. In 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 fact, the investor state mediation style are uh, based on the CEPA investment mediation rules. Okay, uh, because we were the first one as the guinea pig. To, uh, to draft out these rules. And of course, finally, ODR, online dispute resolutions. Um, um, during the pandemic, I think no one can travel. So ODR becomes uh, um, um, very, very um, common. Okay, I think, um, not I think, I know that um, uh, the the YBAM system, which is the Hong Kong system, uh, provides a one-stop shop because in the APEC rules, they are promoting negotiations, mediations, arbitrations, all in one set of terms. They actually call it the 337. Three days for media uh, uh, negotiations, three days for uh, mediation. Uh, after seven days, they commence arbitration. The whole thing hopefully finished within three months at the most. Okay, so it's a one-stop shop service, uh, a lot cheaper, obviously. So I'm not gonna go through all this. Um, it's sufficient to say that um, everything is online um, and, and YPRAM is a Hong Kong initiative. They do have an office, they do have uh, case handlers um, for problems. You can actually call them online and they will have people answering the call. So this is this is um, an online in initiative, okay, for arbitration and mediation. I think I have... Uh, uh, run over time already. So thank you very much. This is my uh, section uh, uh, on arbitration and mediation in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shum, for the uh, valuable insights from which I'm sure we have or have a better understanding of the topic now. So moving right along, kindly mm -hmm. allow me to introduce our speaker from Lawyers Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage. So perhaps Ronald can uh, stop the sharing of your screen first. Um, I am trying. <laughs> my my screen just gone. Uh, oh, I think. Yep. Okay, I, I think we stopped by the uh, yes uh, organizer. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. So um, first, we're happy to have uh, Mr. Uh, Akrapon uh, Kumwinji, members of Lawyers Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage and a committee of YTHAC joining us. So uh, Mr. Uh, Kumijit is a senior associate with over 10 years of experience in the litigation and arbitration practice group. He specializes in advising and representing clients from both the public and private sectors in a myriad of dispute resolution proceedings. Mr. Um, Kumiji is a distinguished guest speaker at numerous national law schools, where he imparts his knowledge on a range of legal subjects, including litigation, labor law, arbitration, and the preparation of legal documents. His commitment to legal education is evident in his involvement as a committee member at the Young Thailand Arbitration Center. He has also earned recognition for his contributions and being acknowledged in a guide on the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, um, the 1958 New York Convention. So, Mr. Akumuji, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, okay, let me share the slide. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for having me here. I think today mostly I'm gonna uh, give you an introduction about the dispute resolution framework in Thailand. So the way I'm looking at the, the topic itself, dispute resolution framework under the Bell and Road Initiative. 
we we looking at this as the cross bordering dispute and how Thailand would be a seat for people of you know foreigners for international transactions that um, want to seek the dispute resolution in Thailand. So now we're also talking about options, talking about the organization involved. Um, I think Williams already gave a kind introduction about my profile, so I'm not going to repeat that again. Uh, just very quickly, it just my, my education. I have a background in um, comparative and international dispute resolution from Queen Mary, London. Um, now for this peer resolution framework, um, I would like to uh, separate separate into three categories. And I know that uh, there's the adjud adjudication, um, but I think now we want to focus on the three things. First is about Thai courts. It's the primary avenue for formal dispute resolution. Also, we were talking about the arbitration and I am be careful when I'm saying the ADR alternative dispute resolution, and I replace it with alternative to the court based resolution. And the reason I'm saying this because when we're talking about the um, Bell and Road initiative, we talked about the cross bordering dispute, and maybe Thai court may not be an option. That's why alternative to the alternative dispute resolution, maybe arbitration itself is not alternative in this kind of sense. The third thing I'll talk about the mediation, negotiation, conciliation. This is about the voluntary and informal dispute resolution settings. So <clears> Thai <throat> court, uh, the first question that I would like to share with the audience is that how to access to Thai justice. Now we're talking about the jurisdiction, talking about the determine which court that um, assume that we have a dispute, which court that the plaintiff should submit that complaint. And I think the basic principle is that we see where the defendants locate, where is he reside, and then we sue at the place where the defendant locate. If it's not about the defendant's location, it's also uh, looking at where is the cause of action arose, meaning that uh, we'll see if there's a transactions and where's the place of performance and then we'll sue them at the place where the performance take place. Now we also have uh, under our civil, sorry, under the civil procedural code, we also have the section talking specifically about the complaints regarding the assets. And then where the asset is, the dispute asset is, is where we can submit a complaint to the court. We also talking about a little bit more where um, there's no defendant's location saying that the defendant is not in Thailand. The cause of action is not in Thailand. However, the plaintiff is Thai national, then Thai court has the jurisdiction in this case as well. Lastly, we also want to introduce that, you know, uh, Thailand, we have the three tiers courts. So we have the court of first instant, we have the appeal court, we also have the Court of the Supreme Court. Now, um, for the Court of First Instant, we also have the Special Court uh, dealing specifically with the certain transaction. For example, we have the Central Intellectual Property and International Trade Court. So, for this, uh, for the for the Central Intellectual Property International Trade Court, would deal with intellectual properties and international trade transactions. Now, what is the key concern that we, I would like to share with the audience? First, the exploring the option of the in-court conciliation as the method of resolving the dispute. What I mean by this is that high court is the civil court system, uh, sorry, civil, civil law system. So we stick with the statutories and not the court precedents. Um, however, before we go into the merit of the case, the very first hearing, the court will set up the in-court in conciliation. Maybe it can be in the way of the formal settings, meaning that they have the 
conciliation centers and both parties go to the conciliation centers and then they deal with it by the mediator or conciliator. However, even we go to the, even when we talk about the hearings, you know, the court determine the issue in dispute, the court will try to invite the parties to the conciliation. And I'm saying this because uh, lately there's a trend from the Southern Bank of Civil Court saying that once you submit the, once submit a statement of, sorry, the complaint and also the statement of defense has been submitted, the court will automatically bring the case to the conciliation. If, and the conciliation is conciliated by the judge. If it can be conciliated, the court will uh, render the judgment based on the conciliation or settlement agreement. However, if it cannot be conciliated, then the court will just determine the issue in dispute right away. Um, so I, I, I want to share this with you because some of the clients, foreign clients, when they go to the court for the first time and then they will think that why the court, Thai courts invite parties to negotiate, does it mean that, okay, my case is weak or, you know, there's a, something wrong with the case? It's not. This is the practice that Thai court would like to engage the parties to the negotiation conciliation. Now I also would like to discuss about the influence of time and um, on the three tiers court legal proceedings. Uh, we have the court of first instance, we have the appeal court, we have the Supreme Court. The whole proceedings we're talking about uh, 1.5 years for the court of first instance, maybe one year, 1.5 year for the appeal and about two years for the Supreme Court. This is subject to the court, this uh, availability is right. Uh, we have the COVID case, there are a lot of cases has been pending and then the court tried to um, resolve this as soon as possible. Uh, we also want to talk about the financial implications about the legal process. Uh, what I mean by this is that when we talk about bringing the case to Thai court, uh, one of the issues is about the money. We talk about the, the the witness who has to travel from, I don't know, foreigners from China, from Hong Kong, go to Thai court to attend the Thai court proceedings, talking about the expert witness that we need to import from outside. And now we also lead to the first fourth items addressing the use of foreign documents in Thai court. So when there's a cross bordering dispute, we're talking about a lot of English document. We're talking about a lot of witness who is not based in Thailand. So this kind of thing would take into consideration whether the client should use Thai court as the dispute resolution place. Uh, the last one is about the mechanism of enforcement and um, in Thailand we don't have the central system for searching the assets for example if the defendant um, so basically what I mean is that we cannot actually search whether the, the, the losing parties actually has the assets in Thailand in Bangkok in Phuket in Samui we need to go to the land office at each state, and then we go to uh, discuss with the with the authority whether the defendant actually has the, uh, the the title deed or has the land in that area or not. Um, sorry, I'm just going back to the to the financial implications of the legal pr process, and I also want to talk about the court fees. So Thailand, we have the. Uh, quite cheap court fees, actually is about 5,500 US dollars for the for the claim amount less than uh, 1.3 million dollars. So it's quite cheap. Now I would like to move to the arbitration. Uh, first, we're talking about the Thai court. Now we want to say that, well, if not Thai court, what about the arbitration in Thailand? And arbitration in Thailand is because Thailand is the signatory to the New York Convention, and we all know that for New York Convention, we should be 
uh, raised in mind that uh, recognition and enforcement of the foreign arbitral, arbitral awards would be recognized uh, would be would be upheld. So the con uh, the the convention itself faci facilitate the recognition and enforcement of the arbitral awards, uh, including in Thailand. So I think I think some of the I think Bruno also mentioned that a foreign judgment in um in Hong Kong can be enforced uh, subject to the uh, uh some some domestic uh ordinance. However, in Thailand we don't have that system. So foreign in uh, foreign judgment would not be automatically enforced by Thai court. What I mean is that once we have once the winning parties seek to enforce the judgment, the foreign judgment in Thailand, it has to go through the whole process in Thai court again, and the foreign judgment can be served as one of the evidence for Thai for Thai court. It will also serve as the way to interpret the foreign law or governing law, whatever it is, for Thai court. However, it will not uh, restrict. Thai court to render the same outcome. Uh, the for, uh, the arbitra arbitration law and the framework is that Thailand has a well-established legal framework for arbitration. Uh, we also have the Thai Arbitration Act governing this process. Uh, this adheres to the international standard arbitral model law. Um, so Thailand is a good place for arbitration as well. Um, we also have the um, good, neutral, experienced arbitrators. And just lately, 2019, that we have revised the law uh, that arbitra foreign arbitrators can work in Thailand. And I just give you a history that before 2019, some of the arbitrators may have some concern that, oh, if they come to sit in Thailand, arbitrate in Thailand as the arbitrators, whether some of the, um, you know, immigration will come, knock their door and say, hey, you know, after you finish this, let's go to the police station with me because you violate to the work permit law. However, it's no longer the case anymore because uh, we, have the, uh, we have the legal framework to support the work permit for the arbitrators. We also have the legal framework to support the uh, attorney, in fact. Let's say that the, the client is a foreigner and they appoint foreign guy to come to Thailand to testify in arbitration. They would not, uh, they, they would not be concerned about the work permit anymore because you know, they can apply for the work permit. We have the uh, legal infrastructure for that. And, and also some of the arbitration institute offer the assistant to obtain the work permit and entry to Thailand as well. And I can name a TAI, Thailand Arbitration Institute, or Thailand Arbitration Centers. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Also, just want to ensure you that arbitration proceeding in Thailand are generally confidential, provided the parties in the private forum. Uh, we have the good place for the arbitration and then the confidentiality is a key in Thailand as well, in, in Thai arbitration as well. Lastly, the nationality and language. This is one of the concerns that I would like to uh, point it out because uh, parties to arbitration can choose the governing law and also the language to arbitration. And language to arbitration, very key because we also talk about how much money for the translation, which can be a lot. We also talk about interpreter, which can be a lot. So, so, so it is advisable that the parties to, 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 to the, the arbitration contract should specific what language that they want to use. So I also want to introduce about the arbitration organizations in Thailand. I already mentioned one, TAI, Thailand Arbitration Centers. This is the institute, institute that under the auspice of Office of Judiciary. Now we also have the THAC, Thailand Arbitration Center, which is under the auspice of um, Ministry of Justice. We also have the private 
but international body ICC Thailand. Uh, I also would like to discuss about the midnight clause in Thai arbitration. I think this is very common uh, phrase for uh, arbitrators, arbitration practitioner where uh, when everyone is tired and they want to put arbitration clause into their contract and it's already midnight, everyone wants to go home. Now we also want to talk that, well, in Thailand, we also have this kind of problems that um, when everyone wants to go home, they will say that, well, let's have the arbitration, let's put the arbitration clause saying any and all such disputes shall be finally resolved by arbitration before Thai Arbitration Institute, Ministry of Justice. You will see it here that this is totally different. When we talk here about the TAI, Thai Arbitration Institute, it runs by Office of Judiciary. Whereas THAC, Thai Arbitration Center, and the, the name is different, is runs by a Ministry of Justice. Now, this is the real case where I experienced it and, and we need to go through a lot of a lengthy uh, litigations and, and, and a lot of correspondence talking whether the parties should go to TAI or THAC and whether TAI or THAC has the jurisdiction in this case. Luckily, I'm not the one who drafted though. This is someone else drafted and I need to interpret it. Um, so what I'm saying is for THAC, Thai, Thailand Arbitration, Arbitration Center, we have the Act of Arbitration Centers and you will see in section four, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, moving along. Okay, in, in section four, the Ministry of Justice shall be in charge of this act. So uh, it come back to how that arbitration, uh, arbitrators should interpret this clause, whether it, it is in uh, uh, Thailand, Thai Arbitration Institute should be the one who has the jurisdiction or Thailand Arbitration Center should be the one who have jurisdiction. Uh, that case luckily has been resolved amicably. Otherwise, then I think this is one of the issues that can be challenged even in the court when they seek enforcement. Um, better is that you can go to the um, the website. There's a model clause available uh, for Thai arbitration centers. Um, they will say that when you resolve, resolve by Thai Arbitration Institute, Office of Judiciary. And when we talk about THAC, you can simply say that it's Thai Arbitration Centers, okay? Now, I think Rona also mentioned a little bit about the third-party funding. So third-party funding is coming in Thailand. However, there's no legal framework that recognize and support this just yet. Uh, we also have the uh, court president uh, that has been up how long ago that if you have no interest for the dispute, you should not give the money to, to initiate, to induce people to have a dispute. And therefore, this is against to the public policy. So third party funding involved in appeals or in direct claims after the arbitration awards in Thailand may face the risk of being notified. Okay, the third one I would like to talk about the mediation, negotiation, conciliations. We talked about how comprehensive this mechanism is. So it's very comprehensive. It can be both civil and commercial disputes, offer the flexibilities and then optimal the solution for all parties involved. Uh, we also have the institute like THAC that enlist the registered mediators and also provide mediator trainings to adhere to the international standard. So the, the, the infrastructure for the international mediation was there in Thailand. Convenient setting is that uh, the mediation is arranged at the venue, convenient for all parties. Um, THAC venue is very comfortable. It's sit in the middle of Bangkok. 
close to the uh, shopping mall. So after finish the case, then you can go shopping. Um, also mediation preserves the party's uh, relationships. Cost effective, of course, you know, if we need to go through all the litigation, arbitration, it will be very expensive. What, what, also, once we talk here about the cross bordering dispute, we're talking about the transaction fees, we're talking about interpretator fees. Uh, mediation, of course, it will be more, uh, it, will, it will be cheaper. Um, and then we also secure the outcome of the, of, of the, of the, uh, secure the outcome. Uh, timely resolution, of course, if you can agree together, then it will be fast. Uh, unlike the court that, you know, again, Thai court, it would take about uh, six years for the whole process, five to six years for the whole process. And for arbitration, I think, uh, yes, just yesterday, I go to check at the TAI, Thailand Arbitration Institute. It is, it is about one year, one point, uh, one year, one month. Uh, confidentiality is, of course, the same. It will be confidential. I also introduced the model clause for arbitration that any disputes arising of or in connection to this contract parties agree to 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 settle the dispute by conciliation in according with the rules of THAC and under the banishment of THAC. And party agree to participate in good faith and abide by it. Uh, lastly, also, this is very um, late tense, uh, is the 2020 uh, regulations. So you will see that even in Thai court, we also promote about the uh, mediation conciliation. So the game changing dispute resolution mechanism is in Thai court. So uh, the court, the, the legislation introduced section 20 ter. They say prior to filing a case with the court, the prospective uh, parties may file a petition to the court that has the jurisdiction of such case in order to request the court to appoint mediator to mediate case between two parties. So even you don't need to submit a statement of complaint out of nowhere, we have a dispute, uh, then we submit this request to the court, request the court to appoint the mediators, then the mediators, uh, and if the parties agree, if the opposing party agree, then the court will accept the pet, uh, the court will arrange the mediation. And this mediation, if it can uh, go through, mediation is successful, then such agreement by abides by the intention of the parties, and the court will endorse to make sure that it is in good faith, not in contrary to the law, and party can sign it, the, the settlement agreement. The very, very good things, and I say this is a game changing dispute restriction mechanism because the court can endorse it by rendered judgment. And it's all free. The process is all free. So um, let's say that you know we have the dispute, foreigners cross-bordering dispute, then why don't we give a try to uh, mediate in Thai court even before you submit the, the complaint to the court or even to the arbitration. So it's free. If it's work, it works. And then the court can render the judgment uh, and the judgment is final. Uh, of course, that with the, with the uh, exception that the judgment is against the public policy, you know, of course, this kind of thing. Um, if it's not successful, we also have the regime to say that then the, the limit, limitation will extend another 60 days from the day that the mediation concludes. So just to summarize this, I think this is a very game-changing regime. For the registration has been changed and become effective in November 2020. Uh, this, the, this process is mediation even before litigation. Uh, court fees, no court fees. Uh, consent, consent requirement. Uh, if one party proposes, the other party agree then we can enjoy these facilities. The settlement, uh, 
the party is allowed to sign the agreement and also the, the court can render the judgment and it's final. If it's if the process doesn't work, then the prescription period can be extended to another 60 days and everything is confidential and is under the supervision of the court. So I think that's it for my presentation. I'll return the floor to the Williams. Thank you, Mr. Kumijit. It has been a very inspiring. Okay, so let's move on. We will now move uh, proceed to the panel discussion and the Q and A session. Now, please uh, type your questions in the uh, Q and A box if you have any uh, for the speakers. Now, may I now pass the floor to our moderator, uh, Dr. Natapon uh, Chitnawang, member of Foreign Affairs of Lawyers' Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage. So Dr. Chitnawang is the honorary legal advisor to the British Embassy, Bangkok. He is a Thai barrister who is recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law, and benchmark litigation Asia Pacific since 2019. He's the holder of uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Prize for International Arbitration, a uh, notorial uh, services attorney. He's a member of uh, SIAP. He's an associate of the Engineering Institute of Thailand. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jina Wong specializes in commercial and civil dispute resolution including international commercial arbitration. He served as an executive committee member of SEAP Thailand from 2015 to March 2023. He also was the team leader of the MOOD team, which won the Eric Burston Award in the uh, William C. Viz East International Commercial um, Arbitration MOOD in 2012, which is the first for Thailand. So uh, Dr. Chinawang, please. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my pleasure to speak to you all of you and to be the moderator for today's discussion. I think just following um, on Kun Akrapon's um, presentation, um, the irony about Thai arbitration is that the Thai Arbitration Center is located in the shopping mall. Right, but the Thai Arbitration Institute is located in the criminal court. So that's um, they are ironic. But the Thai Arbitration Institute is far cheaper um, than the, the center. So you, you pick, but uh, you can experience the, the Thai criminal court, um, uh, how it works, uh, you know, how the, the judicial system works, essentially in the same building. So quite an experience. Um, just to open the floor before um, any questions by the audience, just to perhaps to open some of the questions by um, actually from the panel ourselves. I think Ms. Oliver Kong uh, last week when we, we, when we met, uh, talked about how do we get a glimpse of potential uh, Thai defendants asset pre-lawsuit. So this is a question for Kun Akrapon. Uh, on how do we get some grins or a uh, picture of Thai defendant assets uh, before we, the, the, the clients can uh, de determine to file a lawsuit. So, sorry, I, um, I lost you there a little bit. Uh, can you repeat the question again, please? Yeah, just, just how, how do you make a search for um, Thai defendant um, assets? before parties can uh, decide to uh, file a, a lawsuit in Thailand? Yeah, so uh, we have the the data house uh, is by the uh, Ministry of Commerce. For the companies, they will submit the statement of the, uh, sorry, the, the financial statement, the audit financial statement, we can check it. Uh, they will, they will required by law to submit uh, within the very uh, very first quarter. 
of the year. So at least we would know that well last year how is that business doing, uh, and then we can anticipate that well maybe that company will have some of the money to to enforce it in Thailand or not. Yeah, that's that's the kind of big challenge I think from from the Thai lawyer practical point of view. Um, is to you know search for the assets before uh, commencing a lawsuit. As as Kuna Krapon said. Now just just moving on to the Hong Kong side. I think we have heard uh, Olivia and Rodo talk uh, about the process, the arbitration in Hong Kong and the mainland uh, court system. Now the the question I think many Thai audience would like to know is that um, is there any fast track? Uh, process to enforce an interim measure issued by arbitrators with seat in Hong Kong. Um, maybe Kunakrapon can help answer that from Thai perspective as well. Um, but just just uh, Olivia and Rono to just explore from Hong Kong side. Um, why, why don't I start first? Um, the process, uh, as I mentioned, is a two-step process. Um, you, you commence in one of the seven institutions, and then you get the institutions will issue a letter saying that, yes, they have commenced, and the letter will go to the mainland courts. Uh, obviously, you have to tell the institutions where the assets are. Okay, you, 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 you may have a... Uh, Beijing company, but the assets are mainly mainly in the Guangzhou areas. Okay, so there's no, no jurisdiction boundary saying that you have to go to the Beijing courts to enforce it. Now, um, the the only questions uh, because the process is that simple. I think the only questions left for practitioners is usually where are those assets? Uh, uh, um, is it in Guangzhou? Is it in Shanghai? Is it in Beijing or wherever? Um, this is something that um, um, as, as a private practitioner, I usually check it through a number of sources. Okay, uh, There are investigators which can direct you to the right attention, uh, right directions. There are various government webpages um, to indicate uh, that show signs of where the assets are. Okay, these are government web pages, um, which uh, gives a direction as to where you will be able to seize the assets. Okay, or ask the institution uh, where to send the letters to, to which courts, uh, in which in which cities. So that's uh, uh, the the challenge is not so much as in in the process itself okay the challenge is do you know where the assets are okay in the mainland so this is usually where the challenge uh in in hong kong it's usually a uh, relatively more simple but yet also difficult in that uh, because of the privacy laws it is difficult to 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 search where the assets are okay but there are investigators in hong kong international investigators which uh, I, I retained one um, two or three weeks ago. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm not going to say the name uh, uh, to avoid sort of advertising for that company. Um, um, I, I pay around uh, 30,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is um, five, uh, four, five thousand, three, four thousand US dollars uh, to do the preliminary investigations, at least to find out. Uh, where the assets may be located. So that, that's how we do it in, in Hong Kong and the mainland. Over to you, Olivia. Yeah, I would like to add some uh, uh, points uh, on top of what Ronald said. Uh, basically, in Hong Kong, um, there are searches uh, as well, like bankruptcy searches, like uh, land searches, uh, litigation searches, and stuff like that, which uh, people actually can conduct um, via the internet. Um, then it can give them at least a little bit 
of hate <laughs> whether the person that Sue has actually got money or not. So uh yeah, there, there are there are um as Ronald said, investigators and are actually companies that specialize in searches, all sorts of searches, and they are not that expensive. So I I fully strongly recommend people to do this before they start off this whole drama of suing people because they may end up uh, just get a piece of paper and and they don't get anything back, which is uh, uh, worse than, than before they start, actually. So, uh, yes, do do some homework and, and find out uh, one way or another uh, whether the defendant has actually got any money at all. And Krapon, you, do we have that kind of um, investigator um, concept? Um, is that any legitimacy concern? If you know Hong Kong Party would like to do that in Thailand for Thai defendants, I think it's very gray area. Especially now we have the PDPA, right? Um, we also engage some of the private investigators, but I'm not even sure if it's legitimate in a sense that. How can you uh, obtain that type of information? So I would assume that when they get it, they get it from the authorities. Yeah, I think uh, the investigation from from Thai law perspective would commence after a lawsuit. Then we can, you know, ask court for subpoenas to uh, the defendant itself or to the relevant parties um, to kind of get um, the information, like they count it. You know, but sometimes the judge can be quite skeptical and can be quite strict and, and ask you why you are asking for this subpoena. It's not relevant to the case. And some, some judges do not really like to issue a subpoena to find out about the defendant's assets because it's not his job. His, his job is considering the merits of the case, not their assets. So sometimes it, it's, it's a bit difficult. But most of the time, the, the, the judge would allow that kind of request for subpoena. That's that's from my experience. Um, and also, sorry. And and also um I think when we submit the request for the court to issue the subpoena, then it has to be very precise in a sense that what kind of document that you wanted. And if we don't know what kind of document we wanted, very difficult. Some of them, um, you know, once we serve the summon or uh, subpoena, then they'll refuse saying that I'd never see this kind of document and I don't have in my possession. I may have something else similar to this, but not this one. I hand, hand it back to you, Natapon. Thank you very much. Um, now, to the, from the floor, you, you are from the audience. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you have any question to the honorable panelists? Uh, please feel free to, to ask. Sorry, I think there is a question for me on the chat Q and A um, about the um, mediation uh, as part of the process for litigation, and um, they ask what 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 it means by stop the litigation if mediation is voluntary. Okay, so I explain better on this one. So basically, it's like you watching uh, Netflix uh, on a on a documentary, and um, suddenly uh, you decide to have mediation. So you press the button pause on the on the control button and you deal with it. So if if uh the mediation managed to succeed and the parties managed to come up with a solution and resolve the problem, so you can stop watching that that documentary. So if say the mediation failed and the parties could not come up with a solution, so he you would then press play and continue with this litigation. So that's what happened, basically. Uh, the technical term in Hong Kong is called stay of proceedings. So it's, um, yes, as in pausing it. Okay, so I hope it answered your question. Thank you. Um, is there any more question from the, from the floor? I probably supplement uh, uh, what Olivia have, have just uh, said. Um, the 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 court rules is that um, in Hong Kong there is no compulsory mediation. Okay, and uh, and 
the, the, the way they, unlike in, in other jurisdictions, like in the States, sometimes uh, in certain, like or in Australia or in UK, in certain instances where you have to go, even in, 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 in China, in, uh, where in certain circumstances, you have to go through mediation. The way they enforce it in Hong Kong is that uh, in the high court, and not so much as the district and the high court, uh, where Hong Kong dollars three millions or, or above the jurisdiction, is that um, if you don't, it is voluntary in a sense that you don't have to do mediation. But if you don't do mediation at the end of the day, because in Hong Kong, a, a losing party will have to pay the cost, uh, tax cost of the winning party. Uh, as a rule of thumb in Hong Kong, so to speak, it's around 60, 65%. If that, that's what you get back. The or for hundred dollars you spent on litigation, you get 60, 65% um, um, back. Now, um, if you happens to be the party uh, who refuses uh, mediation, and as I said, it, it is it's always voluntary, then um, you may be in a bit of a trouble because the court we we'll look we we'll look at the file and say, well, why haven't you entered into any mediation? Okay, in the first place, so as to save court's time, and the court may then award uh, um, what we call an indemnity uh, cost order, where uh, the parties, the losing party, uh, uh, may have to pay in excess of sixty five percent, maybe even eighty percent or ninety percent in a very serious situation where the lawyers are involved in recommending, well, that's not, it, it, it may not be correct, or it may not be mature to go to mediation. Uh, even the lawyers may bear some of the cost uh, involved. So that's the that's the way how uh, mediation is enforced. Well, it is voluntary. It is also involuntary because from a private practitioner's perspective, uh, should I expose my firm or myself to an indemnity cost order where the firm may have to bear part of the court, the, 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 the legal cost of the other side. So that's another way of pressing uh, um, the parties to come to the mediation table. I have a question to maybe both of you, Rona and Olivier. Um, for for the lawyer cost, is it is it reimbursed uh, under Hong Kong legal system? Olivier. Well, I I wouldn't say it's reimbursed under the Hong Kong legal system. It's more oh. like the 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 judge will basically um uh, make an order in terms of the costs. So basically, the winners wins all, and the loser loses all. So the losing party will end up paying for their own lawyers' fees as well as the other side's lawyers' fees, about sixty to sixty-five percent, as Ronald said. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a gamble. So, uh, but it's a, uh, so, uh, but but I actually uh, I want to add one more point to what Ronald said about this mediation thing. Um, because the lawyers are, are very worried about about this indemnity cost thing, so lots of lawyers, what they ended up doing is tell the client to sit there and attend this mediation for the minimum time, just to satisfy the court, which which kind of not right. Okay, let's put it this way: this is not meant to be that way, but. Some, I mean, some parties are really uh, reluctant to mediate. Um, so what happened is that's what happened. They would just go there, sit for three hours, and then just leave. Um, that's not the way it should be, but that's happening a lot, to be honest with you. Thank you very much. Um, I actually do have a question. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, um, See, because earlier uh, when when Akra Pon was saying, in, I, I pick up that, um, is there a difference between conciliation and mediation in Thailand? Uh, because in Hong Kong, there is a, 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 a slight um, difference. It, 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 is there a difference um, uh, between the two? Because uh, when, when Akra Pon was saying that uh, uh, there will be conciliation, 
before the hearing in Thailand. Um, um, it is a conciliation in the sense that we Hong Kong understand conciliation or is it mediation before the court, court, court hearing, like like in the mainland? Yeah. Well, well I, I mean, um, in, in Thailand, when we talk about the conciliation, we talk here about the court proceedings involvement as well. So uh, the, the, the conciliation room itself is in the court. Uh, the court will invite us to conciliate as opposed to the mediation where it can be anywhere. Uh, we have the mediator to, to, to help us on this. So, so there'll be a conciliator, am I right? In the, in, 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 in the process, the, the, the court will appoint a conciliator. You're right. Okay. Right. Um, thank you uh, for the question and moving on. Um, now, I think the audience would also like to know um, from your practical point of view, um, you know, if there is any real benefit of selecting arbitration with seat in Hong Kong uh, over Chinese court um, in terms of cost and speeding process. And I think the same question to Budakarapon, um, whether there's any advantage of selecting Thai arbitration, you know, be, be it THAC or TAI over Thai court. Maybe we start from um, the Ronald. Yes. Okay. Um, I I believe that the the the, the practical oh, um, concerns. Okay, for a lot of parties, especially in, for example, the Thailand Chinese trade, the Thai parties will not like to have anything. Uh, uh, any disputes resolved on the China side, be it arbitration, be it courts. Okay, um, uh, but the Chinese side usually will not like to have uh, the disputes resolved in the Thai courts or the Thai arbitration side. I, I think this phenomenon, this this worry, is not it not only applies to to the Thai or the Chinese. Uh, I think it applies to everyone in the world. Okay, because you don't want to have your resolve settled at your enemy side, so to speak. Okay, so oh, um, um, it, it doesn't matter even how 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 good your courts are, or how friendly your courts are, or how cheap your courts are. It's a stance where, uh, for, uh, at least for private practitioners uh, or lawyers like me, will say, "Well, let's go and find a neutral place." Uh, I think that's probably the first uh, first. Uh, Rule of thumb, okay, um, 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 to to the resolve the disputes, and 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 then to be very honest, you are left with not so many jurisdictions, okay. If you have the Thai or the Chinese uh, on, on one side, Thai on the other side, you you are left with what Hong Kong, uh, um, um, Singapore, I think, then, um, um, Korea or, or or Japan or something like that. Okay, so oh, Hong Kong becomes or, or the Thai becomes one of the more more um, 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 easily advice. I, I would use the word uh, um, easily to swallow on the client side to say, well, let's choose a a, a neutral place, uh, uh, Hong Kong. Okay, as a neutral place between Thai and the Chinese. Okay, that that that's where everything comes in. Obviously, uh, you you um, since we are practitioners here, uh, many uh, previously would have chosen. Oh, uh, let's go to go to London or let's go to Paris or whatever. Uh, this becomes very expensive. Okay, and uh, especially in, in Hong Kong, Hong becomes sort of like a a uh, an alternative to it and uh, even a better alternative nowadays is actually online everything is online okay you don't have to travel everything is cheaper uh, um, if you trust uh, your your chat gbt and your ai system okay i, I think the trend to what's now is more um, um neutral place high chinese probably the hong kong side or the singapore side and probably nowadays it's usually online that, that is how, how I see, uh, I feel, it's more like it, um, uh, where the where my clients are asking. 
Yeah, same here. I, I think it's not really whether it's better or not. It's uh, because arbitration has to be in writing. So it's, it's already dictated at a time when the when the contract was drafted, what, what, what the arbitration clause says. So, uh, for example, mainland clients, normally they will pick Hong Kong um, because it's a neutral place, it's closed, and lots of um, uh, Hong Kong lawyers can speak Mandarin, which can help them because... Uh, in terms, I think language is also an issue as well. So, and also another issue, it's the it's the distance. No one would pick somewhere really far off from the two parties involved. So, it's more like a convenience issue, and also, uh, the uh, the familiarity uh, of 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 the parties towards the 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 place. Uh, so it's that's that's what it is. So it's not really who's better, who's worse. I'm uh, related wow. is close to the shopping mall as well. Yes, exactly. That's what I want to. Uh, yeah, that's 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 actually. Um, so I think for Thailand, we have been discussing, and I think two months ago, uh, for THAC, they have an event called Campfire Stories, uh, why Thailand is a hot seat for arbitration, and I've been avoiding that. But uh, just to just to give an answer here is that I think for arbitration we need to make sure that you know the outcome can be enforced, right? And Thailand we have the uh, facilities, we have the infrastructures for you know even the 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 arbitrator list in THAC or TAI. They can also invite the foreigners to become the arbitrators in Thailand as well. Well, just like Rona said, that you can enjoy the facilities about the shopping mall, about the topical weather in Thailand. So yeah, so I, I think I think the key is also about the enforceabilities, which in Thailand can be enforced. Uh, when we talk arbitration, we also want to want to know about the court involvement as well. So just to let you know that um, just last year. Uh, we have the case that um, the arbitrators are saying that uh, this is the insurance claim. So they say the insurance claim is uh, the, the maximum is X, bar, X dollars. And then the arbitrators already award X dollars. However, they say that they want to make a reservation for additional uh, compensation just because that is unwell, you know, the, 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 the winning party is unwell, so they may uh, adjudicate how much money that we should reward later. And then um, according to the contract, it's only limit, the, the insurance company only need to pay for the cap, right? Not more than the cap, how much money. So, so this thing has been disputed in Thai court, and it actually the court of first instance saying, well, you know, uh, the court nullified it because the the arbitrator is, is actually uh, award something more than the liabilities of the parties. And then the Supreme Court actually saying, okay, I know that, you know, it's beyond your uh, uh, capacity as the arbitrator to award more than whatever they, they, that the complaint is. But the, the Supreme Court saying that, well, there's a part that it can be enforced and there's the other part that cannot be enforced. Then the court will enforce the part that can be enforced. So this can reflect that Thai court actually recognize the arbitration. And then if the court see the award, some of them cannot be enforced, then will leave it. But the other part that can be enforced, the court will enforce it. Yeah. So it's quite pro arbitration this day for 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 Supreme Court. I actually pick up uh, one point, which is, which is a very good point of uh, a drop on what you're saying. I, I think many people actually ask the question. Uh, I want to pick a neutral place for arbitration, uh, and and what is neutral? Okay, uh, uh, I'm actually writing an article on it. As a matter of fact. Because you know, if you have the, if, as a practitioner, if you have the Chinese and 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 the Thai dispute, and then you go to the Chinese party saying that well, 
theoretically, theoretically, okay, yes, the Chinese party will want to be a bit in, 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 in China. The Thai party will have to have it in Thai. Okay, where's the neutral place? And, and what does neutral place do to the entire arbitration? I think that the the more the key questions to ask is um, where the assets are located, because at the end of the day, uh, uh, you will need the courts, as Akra Pond puts it. Okay, how how easy to turn your or uh, uh, award into a court order to enforce it? Because at the end of the day, you you are looking for money. Okay, you're not looking for uh, uh, 60, 70, 80 odd pages uh, uh, of documents. So uh, I think the, the, the key concern, if you ask me now, is uh, whilst it is neutral, is a thing where a party feels comfortable. But at the end of the day, if you're looking at getting some monetary side, um, 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 the, the, the consideration will be where the assets are located okay and 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 how easy the jurisdiction will enforce that award okay yes you have to make that decision at the beginning okay uh uh sort of midnight uh, mid midnight decisions okay at the beginning of the negotiations not during the disputes but one can foresee that at, um if disputes arises um, where is a good place? Where, where is the other side? Uh, monetary uh, uh, assets are located. Uh, I think this is also, apart from neutrality, uh, as Akron, uh, Akron uh, puts it, I mean, most of the institutions will have international arbitrators, not only Thai arbitrators. I, I'm sitting on the uh, on THAC. Uh, um, a panel. I'm, I'm, I'm very certain that that the BIAC, the Beijing, or the Shanghai, or the Guangzhou ones uh, uh, will have Thai arbitrators sitting on it. So, so it all becomes international. The the pool is so international, and and the neutrality actually is not from the jurisdiction itself. It's actually from the arbitrators dealing with it. So if you have a pool of international arbitrators, the neutrality points of that fades away. And that leaves with where you can get the money and how easy the court enforced that jurisdiction is another two considerations, which are uh, nowadays I, I, I'm looking at also. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ronald and uh, everyone. Uh, so that I think concludes the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jinna Wong, and all the speakers for the insightful discussion. I actually think there's one question oh. for Olivia <laughs> that just, just comes in 30 seconds ago. Okay, mediation on criminal cases. This is not possible. <laughs> It's only for like commercial disputes. No, we cannot let the criminals off, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> so that's I, I the answer to in, the question. I think I live in, in England for uh, SFC uh, prosecution. Sometimes they allow that, but I think there's a special provision for that. In Hong Kong, we can't. No, in Hong Kong, we, we can't. No, we cannot let the criminals off. We have rule of law. <laughs> Okay, thank you, uh, Olivia, um, for that answer, which uh, concludes our uh, panel discussion. So before today's um, seminar uh, comes to an end, may I now invite Ms. Um, Sariton uh, Nunuatana Ni, Vice President in charge of Foreign Affairs, uh, Lawyers' Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage, to deliver her closing remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to greet to the executive members of the Law Society of Hong Kong, the president of the Lawyer Council of Thailand, our distinguished speakers, and the members of both our SSK and our city. As we draw this insightful and collaborative event to a close, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed speakers and moderator. Your expertise, insights, and engaging presentation have been the cornerstone of today's success. 
We are truly thankful for your valuable contributions. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to the dedicated organizers and team for both organization as well as our audience. Today's gatherings mark the beginnings of what I hope to be a series of collaboration between our organization. We look forward to exploring new opportunities for co cooperation, sharing knowledge, and fostering even stronger ties in the future. In reflecting on today's session, I must acknowledge that we have learned a lot, a great deal about the alternative dispute resolution in both Thailand and Hong Kong. I personally gained significant insight into the innovative in the initiative that are shaping the relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland. In closing, I'm excited to mention our plan to a more concrete cooperation with the signing of MOU scheduled next year. This milestone will further strengthen our partnership and solidify our shared vision. Thank you all for your contribution. And here is to a promising journey ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nuwatana Wanit. The last but not least, may I invite Mr. Amirani Nasir, Vice President of the Law Society of Hong Kong, to conclude this joint event. Um, Amirani, please. Thank you, uh, moderator, distinguished speakers and moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us today for this insightful webinar. I too learned a lot. Uh, I'm confident that our discussions have provided valuable knowledge and a deep understanding of the dispute resolution framework under the Belt and Road Initiative in Hong Kong and Thailand. The two have always been major trading um, entities uh, for many years, um, well before. Uh, even the Second World War. Asian Im ASEAN embrace, embraces international trade and is Hong Kong's second largest trading partner. Thailand, being an important economy in ASEAN, offers a vast market with extensive business opportunities for Hong Kong. The free trade agreement and investment agreement signed between Hong Kong and ASEAN, which came into force in full in February 2021, further strengthens collaboration between our regions, and we eagerly anticipate reinforcing our ties with the ASEAN counterparts. However, with Regional Comprehensive e Economic Partnership Agreement, RICEP, signed by Chinese government and 10 ASEAN countries, Japan, Republic of Korea, Australia, New Zealand, in November 2022, presents a promising avenue for Hong Kong's legal professionals to explore new business prospects. The Law Society is actively seeking ways to support our members' participation in this initiative. The Law Society is very grateful to the Lawyers' Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage for co-hosting today's event, which marks our first collaboration. Without a doubt, we will continue our joint effort to facilitate professional exchanges among our respective members, as well as business communities through organizing events like this one. In line with, with this, we are excited to announce that the Law Society is actively planning a trip to Bangkok next year. We are also working closely with the Lawyers' Council of Thailand to organize a joint seminar during this visit. In fact, we've been trying to arrange this well before COVID, and we've had this in plan for some time. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for spending this the afternoon with us. We look forward to your continued support to, to our joint events, and we strive to facilitate meaningful professional exchanges and collaboration for our respective members. So thank you very much. Good evening, and I hope you a successful um, week ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amarani. I'm sure we have all gained some great takeaways from today's webinar with a better appreciation of the topic. So on behalf of the Law Society of Hong Kong and Lawyers' Council of Thailand under the Royal Patronage, we would like to say a big thank you to the speakers, moderator and all of you for joining us today. Hopefully we can meet you all again in Hong Kong or Thailand very soon. We wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you.